I'm just going to run through um, just a set of uh, slides that, that that I put together. Um, I'll let the slides prop me to <laughs> to to, to, um, to talk, but we're I'm going to go over just sort of an overview of what we've been doing over the last 20 years, um, going from our vegetable operation to our, our uh, now our marijuana operation. Um, so this is our logo. It might be familiar to a lot of you. It's changed a little bit over the years, but it's uh, now changed to incorporate um, Midnight Sun Grown, which is, Sun Grown is a, a common term, term used around the country for marijuana. And so we've trademarked Midnight Sun Grown for our particular brand. So this is me back in 1900 and something. I think Janet Jorgensen might have taken this picture back when I was a botanist at the US Fish and Wildlife Service. I'm originally from Rhode Island. Uh, as is Charlie Hunt back here. <laughs> and I've always dreamed about coming to Alaska, and I did in uh, 1983. I was a trail ranger on the Chilkoot Trail. I was a ranger at Gates of the Arctic National Park, a backcountry ranger, worked as a, a field tech in, at various places. Um, as the intro said, I went back to get my master's in plant ecology at the University of Washington and worked for Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, after that, I started a garden every summer, and I'd get more and more upset as I planted the garden and had to spend the summer out in the field <laughs> um, asking people to water it, and they never did. And so I, <laughs> I lobbied for more and more time off, and eventually I, I quit my day job and, and started the farm. Uh, we cleared land in uh, 1997 and started farming full-time in 1998. Um, oh, there's me on the tractor trading my hand lens in for, for a tractor. And here's the farm. Um, it's just literally a stone's throw from the Tanana River. Uh, we're on a bench above the river, about 60 feet. So we do not get flooded. Um, we have a well that goes uh, right into the, the river gravels. So we have plenty and plenty of water. Um, you can see uh, three high tunnels and two heated greenhouses in this picture. We've added two m more high tunnels, um, and one of those greenhouses has collapsed <laughs> since then, but this is when we were in full vegetable production on the farm. We are also USDA certified organic. We're very proud of that designation. Uh, Sven and Barbara Ebison were the first ones up in interior Alaska to be certified organic, and they convinced me that this was a, a great thing to do. Um, we're very proud of the USDA uh, organic certification. Um, it's the minimum standard uh, for, uh, for, for organics. When the National Organic Program, Program came into being in 2005, um, they wanted to have a standard that, if you wanted to use the, the word organic, um, there was a standard, uh, um, standard to be met. So every year, the USDA comes and, and inspects our farm. We have to have management plans for pr pretty much everything. And if we're not sticking by those management plans, they want to know why. Um, so even though we're growing marijuana now, and marijuana is not a federally recognized crop, they still want to know what we're doing with that land. Um, and, if, and if we're doing anything with the marijuana, that's, that's not in accordance with the USDA organic rules. They'll decertify the farm. So we're a family farm. This is a picture taken uh, maybe about 10 years ago with uh, my wife, Joan Hornig. And, and my kids, Natalie and Alex. Um, we started out as a cut flower farm. And um, people that were um, my, my farming mentors back in Washington State and in New England told me that acre for acre, row foot by row foot, you can make more money with cut flowers than anything else. So that's what we started with. Um, and Joan was just a wizard at um, being really, really efficient uh, with with making bouquets, um, and we we d we did pretty well at at, at farmers markets with uh, with with our cut flowers, and here's Joan in the greenhouse early in the season when there's snow still on the ground, seeding um, seeding plants. We eventually went um, 
to, we still grew cut flowers, but we went to a majority of vegetables. And we'd start early in the season. This is high tunnel one, you guys. <laughs> and uh, we, before it collapsed and we re rebuilt it. Um, and this is, we start early in the season when there is still snow on the ground with uh, our, our salad greens. And this is our spicy mix, for those of you who used to buy it at farmer's market, and our, our baby lettuce mix. Uh, we grow it in, in plug flats, and then we transplant those into the ground early in the season. Later in the season, we'd, we'd direct seed it. So here we are out in the field when the snow is gone early in the season to set up the, uh, the main field crops. Uh, I, I till with the, I start off actually um, plowing with a, with a chisel, chisel plow and then tilling with a rototiller. We'd uh, form beds um, and lay drip tape and use plastic mulch um, for, uh, for all, all the field beds. The reason why we use plastic mulch is it heats up the soil, it keeps the soil moisture in, and it cuts down on our many weeds. So here's, um, before we put the plants in the ground, uh, we will soak them in a, in a kelp solution, uh, which is a sort of a, a root tonic. And we'll use the water wheel transplanter. Uh, this was the, the crew's favorite job here we're planting. Looks like cabbage starts um, early, in the, early in the season. And here's the, Here's the field all planted with, with vegetables. Um, and we grew a lot of food on that farm. <laughs> um, and just, we'll just go through a, a bunch of pictures showing the, uh, the, the different vegetables we, we were growing. This is me and Natalie picking broccoli. I think at one point we'd have, usually we'd have about 5,000 uh, broccoli plants in any, any one season. Um, cabbage. <laughs> this is my son Alex with a giant bok choy. We, we grew a whole bunch of different vegetables because we had a community supported agriculture program. So we'd give baskets of vegetables to um, members of the farm uh, every week. And in order to do that, we had to have a, a large variety of vegetables because people would get bored of the same thing every week. So we grew probably 50 different varieties <coughs> of vegetables. Um, later on, we cut out the, uh, the CSA because if you're growing 50 different varieties of vegetables, you can't be efficient on any one of them. <laughs> so we figured out later on what the the eight to 10 um, vegetables that we did best were, and we, 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 uh, we, we cut back to that. But we'll, we'll go through a, a bunch of these. Um, this is me um, uh, doing tomato starts early in the season, and you can see a little orange clip um, on the tomatoes. We grafted um, tomatoes um, onto a disease resistant rootstock. And what that did was not only it prevented soil borne diseases from entering, uh, entering the plant, but it also boosted production um, probably triple. Um, and this was, this was a, a technique that was developed in Japan in the 1950s. And now anybody who's serious about growing tomatoes anywhere in the country will graft tomatoes. Um, and it, what it allows us to do is to make heirloom tomatoes profitable. Um, so instead of getting one or two tomatoes per plant, we'd get dozens. And so we grew probably 350 beefsteak tomato plants, beefsteak and heirloom tomato plants at the, at the height of our, our production and about 1,000 cherry tomato plants. So here's some of our cherry tomatoes um, at farmer's market. We grew a wide variety to make them appealing uh, to the customer. Um, we also grafted eggplants onto tomato rootstock also, which made growing eggplants up and even in our climate uh, profitable. And so I say, uh, one year we grew about 1,000 pounds of eggplant and, and just half of one of our high tunnels. 
Strawberries, um, not a particularly profitable crop, but draws people into the stand, <laughs> so they'll buy other things. Um, winter squash, uh, lots and lots of winter squash. Um, some years you can grow corn. <laughs> This year we probably could, um, we, although we didn't put in any, any corn plants in, but with the heat we had earlier in the season, you can get a, a good crop for the family. We grew garlic, lots and lots of garlic, and first we were told we couldn't do that up here. It was impossible, but I think we were the first ones to um, prove that it could be done uh, as a commercial success up here. And so we put in, um, probably 200 pounds of seed garlic every year, harvested about 1,000 pounds um, of garlic and just kept that going. Um, and here's, here, here's some of our garlic that we, that we took to market. Um, onions also um, was, a, was a really um, profitable crop for us. And here's some of our, our, our big Ilsa Craig um, sweet onions that we grew. So here's our little dog, Rusty, our mini Aussie. And so what I, uh, what I try to do as a farmer every year is I look at what's making, uh, what's profitable for us and what isn't. Um, and you look at what's making money per row foot. And we did, we did really well with vegetables um, every year, but we worked really hard and the profit margin wasn't that great. And in hearing reports from around the country on what made the most money per row foot, it was without a doubt marijuana. <laughs> and so we switched over to, uh, we, we started growing marijuana, we didn't switch over completely. Um, we worked really hard and Joan and I got license number one um, in the state to, to cultivate marijuana. Um, and so that was, in, that was four years ago in 2000, uh, 2016. We didn't know, know nothing <laughs> about, about growing. I knew how to grow plants, and I knew, knew how to grow plants really well on my land. But I didn't know how to grow this crop particularly well. Um, and especially, especially outside. There's, there's been a lot of work done on growing marijuana inside with artificial lights, but there's not much done, at least up in Alaska, up in the far north, growing, growing marijuana outside. So, you know, the question for us was how do you get from this to this? Um, and so after, after four years, um, we finally gotten our, our genetics down and our growing knowledge down, and we were able to um, grow a profitable crop. Um, so here's, uh, here's how we start marijuana, and here's Atticus <laughs> uh, seeding, in, um, seeding in marijuana seeds in, in the springtime, pretty much the same process as we, as we grow our vegetable crops, um, with the exception that marijuana seeds are incredibly expensive. If you buy them on the, if you buy on the open market, um, they'll cost eight to ten dollars per seed. Um, so we are we were allowed by the state to um, start off with it with the, it's sort of a don't ask don't tell. You can start off with whatever you got, <laughs> and they don't care where you got it from. But after that, every everything has to be tracked. Every gram of marijuana we produce is, is tracked by the state. We have to report it. Every seed that, that we use has to be tracked back to a plant that we grew. And so if we, it's, we, we, we grow seeds from a plant, we harvest the seeds, the weight is recorded. When we plant those seeds the next year, we have to, we have to let the state know how many seeds we're taking out of that, that batch of seeds that we took the previous fall. So here I am taking a picture of Atticus and imploring him not to drop any of those seeds. <laughs> So we plant them in soil blocks, um, not, in, not in plastic. Um, and soil blocks are, are a way of um, allowing the, if, if a seedling um, grows, grows in a plastic tray, it'll hit the side of that tray and start spinning. 
and you all are familiar with that if you if you bought any plants at a at a um, at a garden center and if they're root bound. Um, Soil blocks won't, won't make root-bound plants, and that's especially important for a marijuana plant, which has a, a long tap root. So we, we use a soil mix, and this is a soil block maker. Um, I tell Atticus there's a machine that does this. He, <laughs> we can replace them sometime. But here, here is making, uh, making soil blocks um, in, a, in a tray, and pretty soon we plant the seeds, and we have a seedling. And then a week or so later, we have many seedlings, and this is about ready to plant, and you can see the healthy roots. They're not spinning around. Um, they, they sort of self-prune on the edges of the, the soil block. And you can do this with any, any garden plant. We don't use the transplanter to plant the marijuana plants, um, just because they're so valuable. And we want to make sure that we, we, um, we plant them very carefully. So we run, the, we run the water wheel transplanter over the beds, just like we did with the vegetables, but we then we, we walk the plants out and transplant them out there. You can see the fabric around the, uh, on the fence, and that's required by the state, um, so nobody can look in and, and see a marijuana plant. <laughs> so. And so here's the, here's the field when it's planted um, early in the season. And about a couple of weeks later, and then midsummer, and they grow very, very fast. Um, and they're, it's an it's a very easy plant to grow. It's a very hard plant to grow well, and it's a and it's it hasn't really been done up in the far north on a commercial scale outdoors like like we're doing it. So. Um, Matt Springer, um, who was our grower for, for the first three years of our operation, was really instrumental in helping us get a, get a really strong start in researching all this um, to get going. And here he is um, doing some um, selected breeding. Um, he, we, we find a plant that we'd like to breed to. We'll tie a, a paper bag over that, cut out a little portion of it, and sprinkle, gently sprinkle pollen inside there. Um, and then a day later, that bag is removed so the stem doesn't mold. And then we have, well, about a month later, we'll have seeds. So Matt's now in Colorado right now um, with his family. Um, so this is what we call pot porn. Uh, this, is what they, they, this is what they like to see. Um, the, the main stem of a, of a marijuana plant will grow this, um, the central stalk will be the main cola, and that's what we're, that's what we're looking for. We're looking for um, a tight bud structure on that plant, um, but also what we're up against, and you can see it's been pouring rain on and off all day. Um, it's been nice early in the season. There's no mold out in our field. As soon as it starts raining, the weather gets cool, we're worried about mold in our, in our plants, and that's, that's our biggest enemy. Um, getting them all harvested when, when it's time, um, uh, this time in the season, and hanging them and drying them, and it's a, it's a challenge. And so here's some, here's some more. This is growing in one of our high tunnels. We still have, we still growing plants in, in the high tunnels as well as outside. And it's, um, this is a particularly good looking plant. Um, I think this plant, uh, we've, since they're all our own breedings, this one is, is our, uh, one, one of our most popular breeds. It's called Cabin Fever. And <laughs> we've uh, come up with, a, with several um, sort of Fairbanks-centric <laughs> uh, names for, for our breedings. One is Cabin Fever, one is Ice Fog, um, and we have some others coming down, down the pike. Um, we, the way we're growing is unique, um, in, uh, certainly in Alaska. We're growing outside and we're growing directly in the ground. So we're growing plants just like I've, I've grown plants for the last 20 years, I've grown vegetables. Uh, it's, we've just 
cha change the crop. That is highly unusual in, in this industry. Most marijuana is grown indoors under artificial lights, under highly controlled environments. Um, people who are growing it outside are still growing it in containers and are manipulating light inside greenhouses. We didn't want to do that. I didn't want the, it's farming is hard enough without trying to um, control the environment like that. And I, I wanted to farm outside. It didn't interest me to grow, uh, to grow marijuana in a, in a controlled environment using lots of energy to grow, to grow the plants. So what we have to, what we have to do is um, grow what they call auto-flowering plants. Um, these are plants that will flower um, not based on a light trigger, a light cycle trigger, but based on a time trigger. So the, when you look at the pollen record in, in, um, in botanical history, the, the origin, they think the origin of marijuana came from the steppes of Central Asia. And this was the, this was the common uh, form of marijuana, uh, plants that were not light triggered, but, but time, time triggered. They grew, they grew in a cold environment like ours. They had to hit the ground running in the springtime to produce a flower and to reproduce. So some of that genetics is, is, is still in our plants. The plants that they grow indoors mostly or in greenhouses that they manipulate light are what they call photoperiod plants. So as people started cultivating these and moving these into, into the trop tropical areas or uh, closer to the equator, um, they developed a light, um, a light trigger for flowering. So that's, uh, still people can't understand that we're doing it the old way. <laughs> um, so this is uh, just some more pictures of our plants. This is um, Tiana in, in one of our greenhouses because we still do grow, um, grow our plants in, in the greenhouses. Um, so this is outside in the field harvesting. And so you could go out, out in the field and harvest vegetables and it might take one person to harvest a crop. We need three people to harvest each plant. And so you see Matt there on the right. He's, um, he's picking the plant to harvest and, and, and cutting the plant. We have somebody weighing the plant because every plant has to be weighed. And then we have a recorder who's writing that down in a book. Those um, plants will will go back and get trimmed, and that waste will be recorded to the tenth of a gram. I will take that data and enter it into uh, a program that's in the cloud that the state can view. So that that happens the same day. So here's our here's our harvest crew. Um, it takes it takes this many people minimum to harvest our field, and the plants are out on the trimming table, um, getting ready to um, getting ready to hang. And so there's Matt um, hanging plants to dry. Uh, they they do best dried in, in the dark. Um, and so we'll put heaters and fans in, in in the greenhouse to to dry the plants. And from there we have the finished product. And this to get from here to here is many, many steps. So people ask me often, well, isn't growing marijuana, growing tomatoes just about as hard as growing marijuana? And I say, well, yes, yes it is. But after I pick a tomato plant, I pick a tomato off a tomato plant, I take it to market and I sell it. After we harvest a marijuana plant, then the work really begins. And it goes through several uh, uh, times it, um, to trim the plant, uh, grading the buds, um, trimming the buds, and, and to where it, can be, where it can be sold. So generally, from wet weight to dry weight that you end up being able to sell, you're lucky if you get 10% of, uh, of what, now a lot of that is lost from moisture loss, but still, Ten, if, you're doing, if you're selling 10% of what you grow, you're doing really, really well. And so here's just, this is our cabin fever uh, after it's been, been trimmed. Um, and here's some 
marketing. Here's pre-rolls or joints in a, in a cute box that my wife Joan designed. <laughs> so it's a, it's a play on words on several levels. <laughs> um, and every slideshow ends with a sunset. It looks like I blasted through these pictures. Um, and there's leaves plenty of time for questions, and I'm sure you, I hope you have some. Charlie. Uh, I read an article in the newspaper about trimming, trimming the marijuana, that that's quite a process. There's even companies that, that just do that, that trim marijuana. Do you get yeah. Yes, uh, in fact, we, we use one of, those uh, one of those companies here in town, Big Leaf Trimming, and Atticus, one of my, my main workers here, he just, he's, he might as well be my employee, but he's, he's actually paid by Big Leaf Trimming. And um, they're very, very skilled uh, people. It takes, it takes a lot of practice to trim, trim marijuana uh, properly so, it, so that it's saleable. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. So the the, the question was, um, are there there are there are there specific companies that uh, that that we use for uh, for trimming, and there are people that are that are trained for that. And yes. I heard that uh, marijuana cultivation is the cutting edge of botany. Would you agree with that? Repeat the question. Thank you. You're <laughs> Uh, the, the question was that uh, marijuana cultivation is the cutting edge of botany. I, I, think, I think that's accurate on, on, on some levels um, because of just the amount of money that, that can be gained um, from, from growing marijuana well. So there's a lot of research uh, going into it. Um, but I would argue that food production is still, um, and trying to figure out how to feed the, the world's population is still the, the main challenge for us. There's, when, I, when I go and, for example, buy green magic broccoli seeds, um, the vegetable area, vegetable companies have it down. Of course, they've been doing this for, for years and years, and there's been a lot of R&D put into um, vegetable production. But I know that when I buy Green Magic broccoli, that every plant I plant is going to look the same. Uh, with, with marijuana, um, at least for seed production of marijuana, that's not, that's not true. So you might, buy seed from a, you might buy seed from a company that's, um, that's really reputable and, and well recognized. But there's so much genetic variation in those plants, you still have to do your own breeding beyond that. So I think there's a, uh, so in a sense, it's, it's a wide open field uh, um, for, for, for really, we really need good research uh, on, on marijuana. And of course, since it's a Schedule One narcotic, we're not allowed to, uh, by the federal government, no research money can go, can go into, into marijuana, into, into universities that, that might be able to do that. So yes, so on, on, and in another sense, the field is it's wide open. There's so much research that does need to be done. Did, did that answer your question? It did. Okay. Um, can you share a little bit about your you know, revenues and costs? I mean, how much more are you making for, you know, Okay, so the question was, uh, what, what, what are my costs and profits, uh, um, basically, and, and how that might be different from, from vegetable production to marijuana? Um, the, it's, it's still farming. So, I'm growing marijuana just like I used to grow vegetables. So the part of the, the production, on the production end of things, it's pretty much the same. Um, I'm still, still using the same, um, same fertilizers I used to use um, growing vegetables. I'm still using the same mulch. I, I don't reuse the, the mulch and drip tape every year. That's the one thing we do throw away because it's, it's almost impossible to, re, to reuse it. Um, but as so, like I, I mentioned, seeds cost cost an incredible um, 
an, an incredible amount and we're not allowed to buy seeds, so we have to put a lot of resources into, into seed production. Uh, and so that's different uh, now. So that's, that's a cost that I didn't have when I was, when I was growing just vegetables. Um, the biggest cost is state taxes for me. And so my operating budget might be X amount. <laughs> and my taxes are 2x. So it costs, it costs twice my operating budget. Uh, taxes are twice my operating budget. And in this state, taxes are entirely on the cultivator. So that's what, um, that's what cuts, cuts my profits um, the, the, more than anything. And I, I believe in, in paying taxes, and this industry should be taxed. But the state, um, this is the only state that, that, that taxes only cultivators, and this is the only state that has a set amount of tax on, so it's a tax per pound and that tax doesn't change. So even if the, the price drops, that tax stays the same. So as the price is dropping, um, the cultivators are getting, are getting squeezed. And there's, there's a bunch of um, proposals to change that, but right now that's, um, that's the same. Uh, that's, that's the way it is. Um, so the biggest, uh, as far as my operating budget, the biggest cost is, is labor, just like um, um, most farms and most, most industries. And we like to treat our employees well, so we, we pay higher than industry standard. Did, did that answer your question? Or? Yeah, what, I mean, what compelled, I'm just curious, what compelled you to go to, is it like a 10x boost in profits from going from vegetables, given you mentioned that the biggest Ooh. challenge is trying to feed the population now? Right, so um, the, the question is, am I making that much um, more money growing, growing marijuana than, uh, than, than growing vegetables? And, and is, is essentially, is it worth it? Um, it's, I think the jury's still out. We put, a, we put an incredible amount of money in up front to like, build a solid moose fence, um, to have a security system, and to um, get compliant with state regulations. So the upfront costs were, were, were fairly high, and the, um, the post-harvest processing um, I think cost a little more than we expected. Um, we can't, you can't just pick a plant and sell it. And so the amount that goes in, the amount of time and labor uh, that, that goes into um, to post-harvest processing really, um, really cuts into our profit margin. We did, um, we never intended just to go entirely in, in, into marijuana. We always intended to partition the farm into vegetables and marijuana both. Um, and so we had this elaborate plan that would uh, allow us to, um, to keep growing vegetables and to grow marijuana both and to allow our kids to still be on the farm and work on the farm. The state didn't like that idea at all. And so even though we tried to partition the farm out, um, it wasn't, uh, the state didn't buy it. So we, uh, we had to abandon that plan. So, much to my, my great sadness. <laughs> so we have a we have a question um, that those plants appear to be trees. Is the potency affected by by the height, uh, and do the plants smell? Um, so, yes, the the plants. Some of those plants can grow in, incredibly high, and. But what you're not necessarily looking for a big, tall plant. In fact, we tr we've tried to get get the big, tall genetics out of our out of our field, and and we've been those big, beautiful plants that you saw Tiana standing next to produced nearly nothing because because they still had they didn't have that auto flower gene in them. They just kept growing and growing and growing, putting out vegetative growth, and never put out a flower. So what you're looking for is a plant that uh, puts out a, a plant that is of lower stature, that puts out a flower very quickly, and that flower matures quickly. So that might only be waist high, 
waist high or shoulder high at, at the most, because you want it to mature really quickly so you can harvest it before the rains come in August. So that's, that's, that's what we're, we're up against. And yes, the plants do smell um, incredibly. Our, our house is about a quarter of a, a, quarter of a mile, oh, maybe yeah, about 400 yards from, from the marijuana field, and you can smell it up at the house. Um, so did that answer your question? Okay. Yes? Are the moose interested? <laughs> moose are interested in Yeah, so the question is, are the moose interested? Uh, moose are interested in almost anything. <laughs> As any gardener here knows, what, um, what we have is a six foot high um, security fence, which the state requires a six foot high security fence. We put an eight foot high fence. We went to the large animal research station and if we're gonna spend the money putting a security fence up, I wanna keep moose out also. So we went to the experts and they said, this is what you do. And so we put a big fence around our seven acres. And so um, we don't know if the moose are interested in the plants. <laughs> <laughs> Question? Yeah, I'm curious to hear more and apologies that I missed this, but uh, the soil on your property, uh, what you started with um, and what amendments you made to get started and I guess annual additions and uh, maybe pros and cons of Tanana Valley and soils. Okay, so the question is what, what did we start out with, with soils? What have we done to amend the soils over the years? And um, what are the pros and cons of, of, of growing in the Tanana Valley soils? So we started out with um, black spruce. Um, and we, we, we cut all the black spruce off and made made burn piles, burned black spruce. And what you're left with is really lots of organic matter because as we know, we're in a zone of carbon accumulation, which means carbon is accumula accumulating faster than it's decomposing. Well, that might change as, as the climate warms up, but his historically, that's, that's what we're looking at. So if you're really careful when you clear the land, you'll end up with um, some pretty rich organic matter off that black spruce, what was the black spruce forest. Now, that organic matter isn't necessarily all available to the plants at once. It needs, it needs a period of de decomposition to, 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 to change into humus so it can have a cation exchange capacity that the plants need. So, um, we basically we slicked off the vegetation as the as the dozer operators like to say and then gradually over a couple of years um, tilled very carefully because you don't want to mix up the soil too much you want to preserve that organic um, organic matter and after a couple of years and this was back in the late 90s um, we 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 ended up with some some fairly good soil and um, rich in organic matter, as high as 15% organic matter in, in some cases, and uh, in, in some parts of our field as low as maybe 5%. But compared to some of my farming friends uh, back in the mid-Atlantic states, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, who are trying to preserve their half a percent of organic matter in the soil, this is, this is incredibly, we're incredibly lucky in that way. However, um, the soils are cold, um, and a lot of the, the, the nutrients that the soils have aren't, av aren't readily available to the plants. So we do have to add, um, our, our soils were low in potassium, so we added um, either sulfate of potash or langbanite, uh, which is um, uh, 0, 0, 020 um, to the to the soil and all that we have to, like I said, we're inspected every year by organic inspectors. So we have to, um, we have to use only or, uh, organically approved um, supplements. So we've used langmanite, which is a, a mined mineral. It's not necessarily sustainable, but it's organic. Um, sulfate of potash, which is also a mined mineral. Um, and we use a, uh, 
the base of our fertilizer every spring to add, add nitrogen to give the plants a boost and, and phosphorus is a, a fish bone meal that's produced out of Palmer. So it's a, uh, they take the, um, they, they buy bones, uh, fish bones from the plants, they dry them, grind it up, and it's about 5% uh, nitrogen, 9% phosphorus. Um, when we were growing um, coal crops and beets in particular, we'd have, have to add boron to the soils because our, our soils have pretty much no boron in them. I don't think marijuana cares whether there's boron in the soils or not. Um, did that answer your question? Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, any additional composting or? Um, so we, in, even on a uh, farm, we, we have probably four to four and a half acres cleared. We can't get enough compost. We can't make enough compost on site to, to add, add to the soil. Um, my friends who farm in Vermont, all they have to do is pick up the, uh, pick up the phone, make a phone call, and there will be dump trucks arriving with composted um, cow manure. We don't have that industry up here. So what we, when I want to add nitrogen or when I want to add organic matter back into the soil, we'll grow a green manure, which is basically a crop that we, you grow out and you cut down um, and then incorporate into the soil and let that decompose the following season. Um, and then that will, if in, in the case of um, a legume like field peas, it'll add, it'll add nitrogen because it's a nitrogen fixer. Um, we'll use that in association with oats as, an, as a nurse crop um, to add more organic matter. You, you spoke about uh, the state taxes and the state regulation, and, and I know that there's a marijuana control board, but I really don't know very much about who they are or what they do, and I, I wonder if you can sort of tell us about that or that group, and, and how do they treat you, the, the grower? Okay, so there's, there's, a, there's a couple of entities. There's AMCO, which is the Alcohol and Marijuana Control Office, which is a branch of commerce and they oversee the industry. They are in turn overseen by the Marijuana Control Board who makes regulations. Um, so um, that's, that's how it works. The Marijuana Control Board is five people that's appointed by the governor. And then um, AMCO, Alcohol Marijuana Control Office, um, basically our, our bosses. <laughs> they, they tell us what to do and questions. Um, the Marijuana Control Board um, four times, meets four or five times a year and they clarify questions. They approve licenses. Uh, AMCO can't approve licenses, but only the Control Board can. Um, so that's sort of how it works. They, um, are they easy, are, are, the, are the regulators easy to work with is the question. Um, I think at first they really didn't know what they were up against and frankly we didn't know what we were up against. Um, so and since our operation is unique in the state, we're really the only outdoor operation in the state. At first they didn't even allow outdoor growing. We had a petition the Marijuana Control Board when they were writing regulations to allow outdoor production of marijuana. And so they put two lines in the regulations, six foot fence required, and actually one line, six foot fence required. Um, and so everything else we had to do as if we were an indoor operation, which isn't the case at all. We're not an indoor operation, we have acres that, that that, that, that are under in our, within our security fence. So we were getting um, citation after citation just because they didn't understand what we were doing. So we'd have to take that um, to the board saying, AMCO gave us a citation, um, what do you want to do with it? And with most of those, they said, don't waste our time with this. This is, he's just a farmer just trying to, we have to, 
but they still haven't come up with outdoor regulations, um, for, um, specifically outdoor regulations. So we're still in a, um, they understand us. After four years, the regulators understand what we're doing. We had the director of AMCO out to our farm. She said, oh, I understand. <laughs> They're, they're not criminals. What are you getting cited for? We were getting cited for, um, I, I don't really want to go into specifics, but basically misunderstandings. They, they didn't, sometimes the officers when they come out, don't understand the regulations themselves, and we have to walk. We have to help them um, sometimes, as well as they, they're helping us. So, it's um, it was mo mostly misunderstandings. I guess sit, sitting here, not being a farmer and not being an indoor grower, I don't really know how the indoor regs would mess with your operation. They don't. The indoor regs don't mess with our operation, but the most of the the regulations are written as if you were in an enclosed space that can be, that you can close the door and lock it. Mm -hmm. um, we can't do that on the farm that easily. We do have gates that lock, we have security cameras everywhere. So. Once you get those buds that you showed us, do you sell that or do you refine it in some way or package it? Um, so the, the, let's see if we can get back to some of those, um, but those can be sold at, um, as is, and they're sold, sold by the pound or by the gram. That's how a store will sell them. Locally? Oh. Um, yes, locally. There's, there's stores all over town. Who sells your product? There's two stores in Fairbanks that, that sell our product. One is Nature's Relief downtown on 7th, and the other is the Fairbanks Cut, which is a new store behind Costco. Uh, nature's Relief, yeah. So um, those are sold at, um, as is. The buds are sold as is, and uh, oh, wrong way. And those are sell, so, sold like that. They're they're in in packaging, the childproof packaging when they leave a store. So who does that? Who does that packaging? We do that packaging. So we're allowed. That's the only packaging that we're allowed to do, and and. My wife Joan designed that that, that so package. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> um, so, so my wife, why would the state care if you grew vegetables as well as marijuana? They don't care. They don't care if we grow. But they don't care what we're growing inside the security fence. Um, but they cared that we were trying to partition the farm in such a way to allow our children on the farm. Allow what? Our children to come on the farm. So the, the question was, why would the state care if we were growing vegetables? And so the state doesn't, doesn't care, but they did care that we were trying to come up with a plan to partition the farm in such a way that we could have a vegetable operation and have our children on the farm at the same, in the same, within the same security fence that we were growing the marijuana. Is it Charlie? I, I was wondering about, um, some, some of the stores, I'm under the impression, are related to a growing operation. I mean, they, they have had their own farm somewhere. Is that true or not? Um, so the question is, some, some operations have their own farm attached to their store or in, a, in conjunction with their store. Um, is that true? Yes, it is true. And so that's called being, in the business is called being vertically integrated. So. So you can realize maximum profits when, when that's, that's the case. It's because you're just basically, you're, basically your store is buying your product for nothing and then marking it up at full, full markup. So, um, so it's, the, um, the places that are doing the best are probably vertically integrated. So you don't have a re retail operation? No, no we don't. Over the years, you, you, you learned and made up the gene pool for your plants. Is that correct? So uh, the question is, 
over the years, we were building up the gene pool for, for our plants. Is anybody else, a government, privy to what you have done? So, uh, and, 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 and the second part of the question is, is the government contributing to, to, to the research that, that, that we're doing? Yeah. Okay, so um, we're still on the learning curve with um, producing our own, our own genetics for our particular climate and for what, 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 we're, what we're trying to do. Um, and so I think we've climbed the steep part of the learning curve, but there's still quite, uh, there's, there's still quite a ways to go. And no, there, there's, no, there's no government um, funded research, uh, especially, with, especially with this crop. Um, and because it's still um, classified federally as a, a Schedule I narcotic. So uh, there, there could be no, at least federal research dollars um, put into it. Is all marijuana uh, organic? Does it meet organic standards for USDA? So the question is, does all marijuana meet organic standards for, U, uh, for USDA de uh, designation? Um, so the, the, the answer is yes and no. Um, the no part is that the, the federal government doesn't recognize it as a crop, okay? So when we're inspected by the USDA, they look out at the marijuana field and they go like this. <laughs> it's fallow ground. Okay, how are you treating your fallow ground? Fallow meaning there's nothing there. Um, so we have to, we still have to keep our organic standards or our farm will be decertified as organic. Um, so, um, but we can't call our marijuana organic because it's not an organic crop. And, you know, to, to uh, and the state also doesn't allow uh, people to call their marijuana organic either, because marijuana is a federal designation. And I think that's a good thing, because the reason why that federal designation, federal organic designation came about in the first place is because everybody was saying, we're organic, and there was no standards. So now there's a standard. We meet that standard. Once this crop becomes legal federally, we will just roll right over and we'll have organic marijuana. So, so you have, it is organic when it's recognized by the state or the USDA, that's the qualifier? Um, our farm is organic, our farm is certified organic, but our marijuana isn't. This is no certification because of the USDA does not recognize it. Our farm is certified organic, so we get a cert certificate every year from the USDA saying your farm is certified organic. but we can't call our marijuana organic because it's not recognized as a crop. So I think there's a question back here first. Uh, yeah, curious how you collect your pollen for your outcrossing or hybridization, so you can to force the male flowers in the middle of the environment or not? Okay, so the question is how do you collect pollen uh, to, to do breeding? Um, the, the answer is very carefully. <laughs> and um, in our farm, we always say that Murphy's Law is in effect, which means if something can go wrong, it will. And so we were growing, um, we had a designated greenhouse to grow males out. And um, dur during the summer, and of course an accident happened and all the pollen escaped. Um, so um, we're not gonna try that again. I think the, 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 the good thing is we have enough pollen now for years and years to come. Um, the bad thing is we can't keep working with that pollen, working with the males. <laughs> So what, um, because we have the pollen that we have. So in order to, to progress yearly, we're gonna be growing males out in the winter time when there's no females growing out in the farm. And so that's, that's how we're gonna, we're gonna do that. And then you saw those paper bags over, over branches, we're gonna very carefully pollinate in the summertime. Uh, just going back to the soils, does, uh, does marijuana use more fertilizer, more intensive than your vegetables, and can you compost the marijuana? Ways? So um, 
the question is, does marijuana take um, more, more nutrients than, than other crops, than the vegetable crops, and can we, can we compost the marijuana waste? Uh, the, the, the second part is easy. Yes, we can. Uh, we, we can compost. Marijuana compost just like anything. Um, and marijuana is a, is a fairly heavy feeder for the first part of your question. Um, so it, it, takes, it takes a fair amount of nitrogen early in the season. You want to put on a, a whole lot of leaf growth really quickly. Then we switch that over. Um, on a, in, a, in a perfect world, we'll do a foliar feeding with um, some sort of potassium to stimulate um, with a kelp and uh, sulfate of potash to st stimulate flower production. Um, but you don't want to do those when the buds are, are getting mature. Oh, this, there's a question here first. So you were talking about the organics and all that kind of thing, and, and of course being very careful with the soils and the natural amendments and so forth. Do you have any concerns about spray, overspray? There's been a lot of stuff in the news about the impact on bees, for instance, of potentially of some of the insect deterrence. And I know you have seven acres, so it may not be a concern, but could that be a concern? Uh, so the qu question is, 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 there a, is there a danger of, of contamination from, uh, from sp spray, spraying drift? Um, so we don't have that problem because we're really an isolated farm. Um, and so there's, and it's not a really big agricultural state, so people aren't spraying a whole lot. Um, if, if I had a farm in Oregon, and there's a lot of outdoor, outdoor farms like ours in Oregon, it's, they understand that and it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty common. I think that, that might be a problem d down there because there's organic farms next to conventional farms and it's, a, it's, it's more of a farming economy. That's, we, don't, we don't worry about that up here. Sven? You rotate fields, and that's one question. And the other one is, uh, are these plants sensitive to cold? So, so the question is, do we, one, do we rotate our crops and our fields, and, and two, are the plants sensitive to cold? Um, we don't rotate the crops yet. And the reason for that is the security cameras. And we can only afford so many security cameras, and they're pointed at one part, part of the field. And so as we increase with profits, we can afford more cameras, and then we're going to rotate off of uh, what we've been growing on for the last four years. I do intercrop uh, some clover um, to, to add, add nitrogen, but right now we're, we're not. Um, we're not rotating. We are blessed with high organic matter in the soil, so that's great. But still, we, we, we want to we give that, that portion a rest, and I'm getting ready to, to rotate next year. Um, the second part of the, your question, are the, the plants sensitive to, to the cold? Um, yes and no. Um, the plants are incredibly hardy. Um, they're they're tough, tough plants, but the the buds and the quality of the marijuana will start to degrade as it gets too cold. And of course, mold starts set, uh, settling in when it, gets, um, when it gets to be cool and damp, like it's going to get really soon, um, or is already. Uh, so <laughs> John? So are you are you breeding the plants to do certain things like, you know, I've heard about medical marijuana, so-called, um, you know, where, where they're trying to breed the, you know, getting stone out of the, the plant so you can use it and not be, you know, disabled being stoned. Um, right. Um, so, so, so the question is, uh, are, 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 are we working with breeding to, uh, for, uh, for medical marijuana? Or, or, other things. Um, or other things beside, beside recreation or getting, or getting high. So there's, there's, uh, marijuana is a, is a very complex plant, and it has lots of what they call cannabinoids, which are secondary chemicals that, um, the, that the plant uh, grows other than leaves to photosynthesize and, and seeds. Um, one of those is THC, which will get you high, 
Um, an another is CBD, which is what they call, uh, the, which is, which is the, the, the healing <laughs> drug of, of marijuana. But there's many, many other, other chemicals that they're just beginning to understand. Um, so we have, we're, we're working with, with, with both, um, with plants that are high in THC, which brings us the most money. And also, there, there's a smaller market with plants that are that, that are higher in um, higher in CBD. Now you see signs all over all over town, everywhere. Everybody's selling CBD products. That's because the federal government decided that CBD is okay, THC isn't. So what that means is, now, since CBD is 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 really heavy in hemp. Um, there's almost no THC in hemp, which is it's the same it's the same species, but just 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 different different varieties, different cultivars, if you will. Um, large a, large agriculture can grow hemp on a big scale and extract the CBD from it. So that's that's something that um, small scale farmers like myself will will not be able to. To, to make a profit off of in the future. It'll come from Canada or China or the Midwest um, soon. But there's, but there's many, many cannabinoids. They're just beginning to, to understand. Um, and there's many different terpenes, which are the, the chemicals that make marijuana smell nice or bad, depending on, on your opinion. Um, there, it's, it's really, really incredibly complex. And so they can extract the, the, those from the plants as well. Are you allowed to sell your seeds for a retail sale? The right. question is, can I sell my seeds for retail sale? And yes, I can. I can. Do either of those two up and sell them? I, uh, I do not sell my seeds um, because one, we don't have the genetics down to where, to where we'd like them. So you might, you might buy a seed or a bunch of seeds from me, and you might, they could be all over the map on, on what they produce. Since we're growing thousands of thousands of plants, we can pick and choose and cull plants. But if you were to buy five or 10 seeds from me, it wouldn't necessarily be what I said it was because we, we, haven't been, we haven't had enough time to stabilize our genetics. So that's the long answer to no, I'm not selling seeds. <laughs> yeah, do you test the, the buds before you sell them or do you get a different price for different potency? Um, the question is, do we test the buds before we sell them? We are required by the state to test every harvest batch. And so every harvest batch is tested for, um, they don't test for pesticides, and I wish they would, um, but it's tested for potency, um, it's tested for microbes, uh, so they, they, they grow them out in a petri dish and see if there's, there's harmful bacteria or molds in them. And that has to pass inspection. It has to pass inspection on those, those harmful molds and bacteria. If it Passes that, I can sell anything. It might have a low potency, it might have a high potency. But in reality, I'm only going to sell what has high potency. Um, and so the, those are tested. I can also t test for terpenes, which gives the aroma. So right now, as our market becomes more sophisticated, people aren't necessarily looking for potency, but they're looking for these, the, the secondary terpenes, things that will um, enhance your experience, give you different moods, give you, um, heal you in different ways. Um, so there's that kind of testing, and there's also the testing that my crew can do. And now, they, the, last year, um, the state allowed us to give samples to our employees for them to give quality control. <laughs> So they, they have to, there's a form that they have to fill out, has to be certified by the state, and they have to give a review. And those have to be on file for the state to inspect. And so you bear the price of the, the testing is a, the grower's cost? The tester is my, is, is my cost. Yeah. 
Uh, there's a question in the back. I think we've got time for a couple more questions. Right? Well, I have two unrelated questions. One, you can answer the question about moose, but what about two-legged critters or rabbits or things like that? Do they take much interest? And the second question is, what happens to the trimmings? OK, so, so there's, um, there's two questions. Are, 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 are other smaller animals interested in the marijuana? And what, what happens to the trimmings? So the first, first question is, um, snowshoe hares get through the fence all the time. There's squirrels all over the farm. There's, there's voles. We've seen voles actually girdle plants before. That's really rare, but they, they have done that. Um, snowshoe hares sometimes nibble on the plants, but they're not particularly interested. Um, and so not too much problem with that. And what happens to the trimmings? So like I said, every gram has to be accounted for. So there's trimmings that I can actually sell to product manufacturers that will still extract more from that. Um, so those are sold at a lower grade, and they're taxed at a lower grade. Um, and then really stuff that's unusable, um, mold or leaves that don't have any uh, chemical crystals on them, those go into a compost pile, but not before they're weighed and reported. How many crops per year? The question is how many crops per year? There's one crop per year. This question yeah. back. So, are you just growing nails in the winter, or did I mishear you? You're yeah. growing nails in one high tunnel, and then you have to do them. Are you growing at all? Um, the, the question is, am I, am I growing males in the winter, um, or am I growing at all in the winter? Um, we don't grow. We don't really have the facilities to grow in, in, in the in the winter. The only reason why I would grow males in the winter is so that I can grow, I can collect pollen at a time where my main crop won't get contaminated by the pollen or seeded by the pollen. So uh, we have a small growing area in one of our, our, our winter units that I can grow a handful of plants to grow out pollen. And other than that, it's, it's really just grown outside in the summer. Other than other than those few plants that will grow in the winter for seed increases or for pollen, everything's outside in the summer. <laughs>